All right. Phoenix Center is known for its economic work, but we do have law in the title, and I always enjoy our annual symposium where I get to dust off my law degree and, uh, and hang around with my people. Um, and as it happens, um, very often at Phoenix Center events, shortly there's always some sort of major case, and in this case it is the appeal of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Um, oral arguments are scheduled for um, February 1st. And so what I try to do is put together a panel of the best lawyers that I know. Uh, going from my left, Angela Jean Carlo, uh, I'm real, former acting chair, and by the way, former Jerry B. Duvall Public Service Award recipient, Maureen Allhouse, a good friend of the Phoenix Center, and of course, our good friend Brian Tremont. Thank you so much, Paul, for being here. So let's talk about the case, or as some of us like to call it, the gift that keeps on the gift. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I would say, in sort of reviewing the case, and we're all sort of laughing about getting involved in this, um, is, uh, let's start with, with the first question, is I call it the Chevron merry-go-round. Um, you know, this whole case is going over the definitional uh, debate over whether or not bias should be a Title I service or Title II service. Um, the court in uh, Brand X, excuse me, in, in U.S. Telecom, predecessor case, said, look, citing Brand X, we're done. So they, uh, you, you, we're, we're, uh, you have committed the statute to ambiguous, the commission can define it as you want. There you go. Um, the current commission seized upon that and said, well, if I can change my mind once, I can change my mind again. Um, so the question is, is number one, I'll start with you, Angela. Do you think the court's going to say, <coughs> okay, we're, we're bound by that. And, then, and here's the interesting other question, and I think people keep looking for this. Do you think we're ever going to get a court to actually say, okay, I'm, this is the definition? I mean, we, we, even Justice Scalia never said that in Brand X. So let's start with you. Um. So I call it deja vu all over again, okay. Yogi Berra, right? I mean, this has been going on so long that there are people that don't even know how long it's been going on. Um, and I, I think that, um, look, I mean, Brand X, the outcome of that was that broadband can be an information service, right? Then, of course, as you said, U.S. Telecom, yep, broadband can be a Title II service. So I always think about Fox Broadcasting, which says an agency can make up its mind if it provides a reasonable explanation for doing so. Part of that, I think, is the amazing amount of data on the record that this FCC relied upon, including the counterfactual analysis from our friend George, which I actually read and understood. Um, I skipped over the pictures. I skipped over the, the you know the crazy diagrams. So yes, I I mean hopefully, hopefully is it was a long, comprehensive, well thought ruling by these, this FCC, and hopefully the it'll be able to they'll be able to be, be upheld. You know, it's obviously an important policy debate about how broadband should be regulated, and there's an important legislative debate going on. From a judicial standpoint, I think it's very straightforward and, and pretty well settled at this point. The Supreme Court in Brand X said the FCC reasonably construed the statute to make broadband internet access and information service. And that obviously binds the DC Circuit. And although the clients I represent, cable industry, ISPs, sought cert in the US telecom decision, it's actually helpful to industry in the sense that the Supreme Court denied cert because the U.S. telecom precedent, while upholding the telecom service classification, made very clear that the FCC had discretion to go either way on the definitional question. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the denial of rehearing, uh, the, you know, there's a separate concurring opinion again saying that, that there's no mandatory classification under the statute. In other words, there's no Chevron step one classification in the view of the D.C. Circuit either in the direction of information service or telecom service. So my clients have argued in the past that the statute must be construed such that bias, broadband internet access services is an information service, 
that petitioners now challenging the FCC are saying the opposite, that it must be construed such that it's a telecom service. I think the DC Circuit has made clear, and again will make clear, that, that the agency has discretion to choose between those labels. And really, all the action in this case, if, if there's anything to decide, is under the Administrative Procedure Act. And this is whether the FCC adequately justified its order. I'm sure we'll get into that. But from a Chevron standpoint, I think it's, it's quite straightforward. Um, so I, I agree with what the two uh, panels preceding me said, and thank you to Larry and the Phoenix Center for having me. Uh, one of the things that I did before I went to the FTC is I actually worked at the D.C. Circuit for five years. I was a staff attorney, and I was a law clerk to a judge there. And so when you kind of extract back out of this big Donnybrook about net neutrality to the question of can an agency who has a statute that gives them discretion to make a decision uh, change its mind, uh, I think the answer is clearly yes, if there is a record upon which they can make it and they explain it and they follow the, the administrative procedure. I think the interesting question is the idea that Chevron deference itself is starting to be questioned. Right? And, but I don't necessarily see that happening at the D.C. Circuit level because they're bound by Chevron's Supreme Court precedent, uh, City of Arlington's Supreme Court precedent. So if they... Um, whatever the outcome is in the D.C. Circuit gets appealed up to the Supreme Court and they take cert, there might be some interesting discussions about Chevron deference itself. But I, I do think that um, the agency will have deference to make to make that decision if the question is the record support. Brian? Uh, so shockingly, I agree with what everyone else has said. <coughs> um, although I would go back and say, you know, and, and Matt alluded to this, I do think the better reading of the statute is the original Brand X reading. I think that it is uh, true that DNS and caching are intertwined uh, and that this is an integrated offering uh, between a telecom and information service. So I do think the better reading of the statute is the Brand X reading. Uh, so ultimately, I'd love to see that vindicated, uh, admittedly some personal investment on that front. Uh, I, but I do think the com this, la this commission explained that technical component of their rationale well, as well as the other public policy bases for this, uh, this decision in this case. Um, ultimately, I just, yes, it's true that the courts have upheld the ability of an agency to change its mind, even during changes of administrations, as long as there's a, or as a result of you know, changes of administration, as long as there's a record to back it up. All of it just underscores to me that it's something this important. Uh, there's a need for a legislative solution. Uh, this is no way to run a seventh of the economy, uh, where we're ping-ponging back and forth between uh, regulatory regimes, depending on who's elected president of the United States. That is nonsensical. Uh, it does not provide the kind of um, stability that the economy needs globally or domestically to get uh, this part, this undergirding, this foundation of a lot of things this country's trying to do to get it right. And so I think that is the most important lesson from all this, putting aside how this goes. And I do fundamentally agree this is on, on this point, at least, that this is brand X all over again, and it's hard to imagine how we get to a different result in the DC Circuit. Okay, but then again, that, that brings me back to my point. You know, you've got this sort of, we're getting the rest of the, the merits of the case, but you do have this policy implication, so I think you're right with the question. So, I mean, do you think that depending on how the court case comes out, I mean, when does this end? Or do we really think the court's going to, I think there's a hope by some litigants that they're really hoping the court's going to, this is how we define it. Because the court's never said it. So the agency has the discretion to define it. I, just, I think it's hard to imagine a court getting there. I don't know if others disagree, but I think it's hard to imagine. Yeah, I, well, I don't think you can get there right. uh, under this statute. Because once the Supreme Court Brand X said the, the relevant definitions and what it means to offer telecommunications is ambiguous right. and decided at Chevron step two, the D.C. Circuit really can't say otherwise. And there are arguments being made that what the FCC did is outside of Brand X, and we can talk about that. I think those arguments are clearly wrong. But, but yeah. fundamentally, once the Supreme Court says the relevant statutory provisions are ambiguous, a lower court can't say, well, now they're clear, uh, because you know, what, what the court can do is say you haven't justified your decision adequately. But I, I don't see any real prospect of a, of a court, this court or any court, saying the statute now has a clear meaning. Well, then let's talk about justification. Um, actually, sitting in our audience is the man who coined the term economics-free zone. Um, how you doing, Tim? Uh, but actually, you should read Tim's uh, Tim's piece that he did on it because actually I cited it in our meetings 
roasting a turkey and doing a table of authorities. Uh, as I told you, I had to work at a fancy law firm. I had to do the whole thing myself. Oh, there you go. Uh, there you go. That's right, Brian. I throw that in. Poor Martin. Uh, that's right. Sole practitioner. Um, so, do we think that the agency made a good showing? I mean, you know, there's a lot. I mean, if you go back, you read the briefs. Um, you know, uh, Chris Wright, who represents the Internet Association. You know, I joke with him. I thought you'd like this, Chris. He said mean things about George. Um, <laughs> And, and, but I did find, and it, but in the main brief that, that the interveners had made, it's funny, they, they totally didn't mention George once, which I thought was actually kind of fun. So what do we think about the agency's case? Do they, you think it's good? And then, but on top of that, let me take a quick back, I'm sorry. But a U.S. telecom people made the argument, and the court basically said, I don't sit as a court, as a, as a judge and a, as a, as a peer review journal, you know, we're just a court of generalist jurisdiction. They didn't want to get involved, and they gave the agency great deference. Do you think the court will give that same amount of deference, so they'll think about it a little bit more? Ed, yes, you. Um, here's the thing that, that bothered me about most about the um, U.S. telecom outcome was, and was it seemed to me that that court went to great extremes to give a ton, like, so much deference that there was language in there that I read as saying, well, far be it from us to question this expert agency. And I, I was kind of thinking, but, but that's your job. <laughs> so I, I think that it was a little bit, um, I don't know, I don't want to say, I'll just say tortured, even though I think that's the, that's the wrong word to use. Um, so I would hope that it'll just come back a little bit. But all that said, I, I feel that way also because I feel like this order was um, was much more substantial and relied on data in great part. So, yeah, but going back to the 2015 order and that litigation, there's an interesting question about whether there should be a different legal standard when an agency is going to impose heavy-handed regulations, you know, subject the economy to common carrier regulation. Um, uh, or whether it's going to eliminate some of its own rules uh, within its discretion. And I, and I do believe whether it's the major questions doctrine that now Justice Kavanaugh wrote about and Judge Brown wrote about, or just as a matter of sound policy and restraint and kind of the axiom of do no harm, there should have been a more robust evidentiary showing of harm for the commission uh, imposed common carrier rules with really far-reaching implications for investment and innovation. Now, obviously, I have a bias in this representation. State, a lighter touch regime. Yeah, another way to think about it is, you know, we've spent a decade debating whether the FCC has <laughs> any authority to impose net neutrality rules under the statute. It arguably has some limited authority, but by no means does it have a mandate. There's really no fair reading of the statute that says you must impose heavy-handed net neutrality rules. So I, I think from a legal standpoint, it's quite clear that the agency had the ability to return to a, a different regime, and at bottom, as the Commission said in its reply brief, that what the petitioners are, are doing is debating the wisdom of the policy, and they're entitled to do that in the legislative debate and in the broader policy forum, but there's certainly no strong legal argument, in my opinion, that the agency was compelled to maintain common carrier rules. Maureen, you came within a position where the agency has to justify its wares and why is it rare for it. What are your thoughts? I do think that the um, Restoring Internet Freedom Order had a much more complete record, certainly on the, the economics uh, of it, and a more um, uh, detailed analysis. Uh, I was certainly gratified that they cited to the FTC's 2007 broadband internet access report uh, quite, quite extensively. Who would have written that? Who? who I don't know. <laughs> Someone <Okay>. very wise. <laughs> It was a lot of work, and I'm glad that it still uh, is, uh, but people find it useful. Uh, but I, one thing I would say in comparison is if the, the record for the um, open internet order was to review, I don't see how the record for the restoring internet freedom <laughs> um, order would, would not withstand review. Brian, any quick thoughts on it? I, I would have agree. I would just go back. To, I think there's a couple things. One is it does seem intuitively obvious that less regulation is going to lead to more investment. That doesn't strike me as particularly groundbreaking. Uh, first, um, 
<laughs> Second, I mean, it's brilliant, brilliant, I meant to say. Uh, and uh, in addition, your George has this study that shows, what, 30 to 40 million dollars in decreased investment as a result. Um, the commission's brief talks about uh, 2009, 2014, increased investment, 15 and 16, decreased investment, and then we see in the last, the Ray Baum report, et cetera, another rise in investment coming back out. So I do think the fundamentals of the case are there uh, to make this work, but at, at a very fundamental level, this, you know, the, the Title I classification, if you go back to 2005, uh, or I guess when it started in three, uh, was based on the idea that, that we wanted to promote, <clears throat> we might wanted to promote this nascent doctrine as a, as a hotbed of innovation and competition. It is hard to argue that that has not happened. Um, the notion was that people could build their way out of their silos, whether it's a Title III silo for wireless, <coughs> a Title II silo for wireline, or a Title VI silo for cable. <coughs> and those things have happened. So I do think the factual record for the restraint that was exercised in the early 2000s is there to maintain this. I think that the, the um, open internet order was the was an uh, outlier. Uh, I think the case was, was hard to be made, difficult to be made there. I agree the record wasn't that strong. I also think that at a purely practical level, uh, the vagaries associated with that order, um, where the Title II regulations applied, but some of them didn't apply at this time, and there was the forbearance. There were a lot of very open questions that if the if there had been a real if if I'm sorry if Hillary Clinton had been elected, uh, there would have been some serious implementation issues that I think would have caused the court to pause. Uh, but they avoided that, and instead we're back to this literally restoring the status quo ante, where I do think the record of American leadership and investment is very strong. So I, I, I think this, the, the case on the factual side is very, very solid here. Well, let me ask you this question, Brian. Um, as we know, the court back in Verizon, again, because you're, this whole thing has always been trying to figure out how does the FC implement some sort of rules given the pre, pre-classification dancing around the, the constraints of Title I. And the court in Verizon, D.C. Circuit, gave a roadmap under Section 706. Um, and I guess, myself included, we all thought the FCC would follow the roadmap. I think Chairman we would have thought he was going to also. <laughs> well, it wasn't. He had originally followed. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. Yeah. Yes. Well, we all know how that worked out. Yeah. I remember being in the oral argument, and um, Judge Taylor looked at, at Jonathan Salad and was arguing I gave you a roadmap, why did you follow it? And Jonathan explained he needed to do this. And it didn't seem to bother the court. Um, but yet, in the Restoring Indian Freedom Order, and I actually posited this to uh, Commissioner Carr at this year's uh, event, because he was the general counsel at the time, neither did this administration follow the roadmap. In fact, they went really outside. And I said, well, why not? <laughs> and so to me, the question is, particularly that they found that 706 was hortatory, do you think that's going to play a factor in the court at all, given the amount of ink that they've spilled over developing this jurisprudence, or not? I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd be curious what Brendan said, because I probably should just adopt that answer. But uh, I, I just think it's hard to <clears throat> talk about substituting your judgment for that of the agency. If they're going to go back and say, we gave you a roadmap, and now they're going to question why you didn't follow it, and that's the only answer, I just don't, I don't think the law supports that kind of conclusion. Yeah, but I, I think it's back to the point that Section 706 has always been, at most, uh, permissive authority. It's never been argued to be mandatory authority. So, so the commission, I think, could have gone a different route here and adopted limited non-common carrier conduct rules under Section 706. The D.C. Circuit said so. Um, but I, I just don't think there's any even remotely credible argument that it had to do that. So it's hard to see how that's going to factor into this appeal. Yeah, I, I view the analysis in that decision is as I mean, as a roadmap, but at the same time, it, it it's never mandatory, right? I mean, um, the other thing that I've been thinking about is, given that this the um, restoring open internet freedom is sort of back to back to where the commission was for all this time. And, that um, 706 is mandatory and 
well, we, we laid out the path and you, you, know, you had to follow this intention with all the deference that the court was giving. Like Ed <coughs> said, they were very deferential. So I think right. it would be quite a shift, quite a changing gears for yeah. now to be like, no, there's only one way to do this thing and if we told you what it was. It was almost like if you really want to do this, here's, here's a good way for you yeah. to do it. Yeah, I think it was very reading. I just, I just find it interesting yeah. given, in full disclosure, I have a big, large, Broadband under the statute. And I think this maybe hasn't gotten 
much play in the briefing as of all the word limits as it might have. But the, the, the statute in Section 3 authorizes the commission essentially to choose between the information service classification and the telecom service classification. When the Supreme Court decided Brand X, it said that the commission was exercising lawful authority when it classified broadband as an information service. So, so that is the essence of the commission's regulatory authority, really, is the classification authority, because what comes with that information service label is the light touch deregulatory framework. So I think it's hard for the state AGs, the other petitioners, to undermine that core authority, but, but even if they could, uh, the, the conflict between state net neutrality mandates that are common carrier mandates and the, and the FCC's regime should result in the invalidation of state laws regardless of what the FCC said. And just to repeat, <coughs> excuse me, the outcome of this line of reasoning from the state AGs is passingly strange, right? So in order to have preemption, <laughs> by the federal government, you have to have affirmative regulation. So we don't, the FCC has to decide whatever rate regulation or 16,000 other things, or Congress needs to have given them explicit authority to do those things in order for there to be preemption of the states. That can't possibly be true because it would negate any federal decision to refrain from regulation. So it, it, the inverse is a big problem, I think, for the other state attorney generals argue this case. I, I don't really have anything to add. Brilliant contributions is the transparency rule. But we still have antitrust law and general consumer protection law, right? Which are pretty important too. Uh, and that is something that the 2007 bipartisan FTC report looked at and said was sufficient in, in this space. So just going with the transparency rule, that is a very classic FTC type of enforcement. Right? You are required to make a certain disclosure publicly. You lie about it, uh, you don't fulfill that promise to consumers, the FTC can bring an enforcement action. Uh, the FTC has a memorandum of understanding with the FCC to, to enforce this. Uh, so I think that that role is, is very straightforward. Um, I think that you know, the more interesting issue is, um, is the, in the antitrust uh, side of things, which not just the FTC, I mean DOJ can enforce that as well, and the kinds of concerns that net neutrality proponents keep um, raising are classic kind of antitrust concerns, which is foreclosure, which is uh, you know, vertical <coughs> integration. Someone's going to you know, use their monopoly power in one market to, to uh, leverage it into another market. These are issues that the antitrust laws can address when they have any competitive effect. And that's what the 2007 report, the FTC report, talked a lot about, which is this kinds of behavior that net neutrality rules are trying to stop are not on balance or necessarily or typically bad for competition or for consumers. They can be in certain instances. And that's why antitrust law with a rule of reason approach is the appropriate approach here rather than a per se prohibition on things that on balance, typically, can benefit competition and consumers. Like the dreaded price discrimination. You know, that sounds so bad, but price discrimination is a way to actually expand access, expand access for, you know, people who otherwise couldn't necessarily afford the service if it was all at a single price. When you think about people who are flying the cheap seats in coach, uh, well, you know, I'm paying $6,000, or not me personally, but <laughs> someone is paying $6,000 for me to fly to China. Um, I think that, you know, when we think about it that way, that's price discrimination. We don't normally say, oh my gosh, it's a terrible thing. It should be pro se, uh, excuse me, per se uh, prohibited. Can I, I just love this point, and I just want to amplify it for just a second, which is to say that Maureen just detailed how, under this regime, ISPs are treated like other parts of the economy. 
It is not a breathtaking assertion. We used to talk about it in FCC land how the left loved newspapers. They loved newspapers so much they loved them to death, right? They were so important, they were so critical for our democracy that they were going to squeeze them so tight and not let them have newspaper broadcast cross ownership and what, until the newspapers are all dying off. And I think you run the same risk of the ISP economy that certain sets of rules are going to love them to death. You're going to restrict the flexibility and the business plans of ISPs to the point that you're going to make their business less economic, they're going to do less investment and less deployment. And it is the exact same rationale. And it is, especially in a world where the edge providers or whatever we want to sell, call the uh, FANG, uh, have you know, market capitalizations dramatically larger and are you know, in a much more nimble market position, whether it's on privacy or other issues, you are, you are threatening to, to love the ISPs to death. I think it, we have a track record of doing that in newspapers, and I, I think that one of the reasons the 2015 order was a mistake was it had the same sort of intellectual um, gaps and that this ISPs are so important, therefore we must. And the rest of the economy seems to be functioning relatively fine uh, under FTC jurisdiction, and we would all be better off, in my view, if, that, if, if the ISP economy was subject to it as well. And can I have one more thing on the transparency? Uh, so I, I also did want to mention there was this question about whether the FTC would have authority over the non-common carrier activities of ISPs. And that was a bad side effect of the 2015 order when it, this was all reclassified as a common carrier service that ousted the FTC of jurisdiction, and it didn't give the FCC the jurisdiction to cover a whole host of consumer protection problems. So the FTC was litigating a case against AT&T Mobility having to do with unlimited broadband internet access. I'm uh, sorry, a wireless internet access. And uh, the FTC won at the district court level. A panel, a three-judge panel of the um, Ninth Circuit said, oh, the FTC's common carrier exemption means it can't have authority here. And then there was an en banc decision, unanimous decision by the Ninth Circuit. I was Delighted that this happened. This is one of my long term goals, yeah. right? Uh, was to clarify that no, the FTC does have authority here. So that bar, which was often raised as like, oh my gosh, you know, the FTC has to be here because the FTC can, is no longer uh, the case. The FTC's authority over ISP um, internet behavior you is said established. A, a vitamin supplement company should require a railroad, and they'll be out of FTC jurisdiction. It, there were all kinds of issues, that, yeah. you know, billing issues and other issues that um, could have been well, a problem. Well, let me ask you a quick legal question. I honestly don't know the answer, it just popped in my head. So, um, if antitrust is there, um, I was just at a conference again, too, and, and Tim Wu was there, and his argument was that state AG should bring aggressive suits under state antitrust laws. So, is the fact, in this particular case, the fact that there are any federal antitrust laws. Is that enough to overcome a, a challenge to preemption? Is that sufficient in terms of, in other words, the federal, rather than the FCC is not abrogating the deal, but the whole entire federal government is not abrogating the deal? So federal antitrust jurisdiction does not oust state right. antitrust jurisdiction. But, but, this, but, 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 <laughs> but you know, I think certainly, obviously, that's, that's right. Yeah. But um, one thing that gets lost in this preemption fight about broadband internet access is that states um, didn't have the type of regulatory authority they're seeking to assert in the first place. Even before we get into a, a question about whether the FCC has taken it away, these are quintessentially interstate services. And this is why there are commerce clause arguments being asserted in the state litigation alongside preemption arguments. The internet is inherently interstate. The FCC under Democratic and FCC leadership has consistently said so. So because of the Communications Act that divide between and intrastate state regulatory commissions and state legislatures, insofar as they're looking to impose utility regulations, couldn't regulate broadband internet access in the first place. It's not to say you have free reign from an antitrust perspective. You don't, under federal law and probably under state law. But, but you know, this, what's often lost in this debate is these interstate services are just not subject to state regulatory. 
truly a red herring. I mean, there's not a net neutrality issue there. There are appropriate tiers of service for consumers, and those are probably not appropriate tiers of service for businesses and governmental entities that may need unlimited service or quality of service. And, and so that, that really is being deliberately used to try to gin up this boogeyman of public safety harm. I think it totally lacks credibility. I'd be really, really surprised if that played a role in the, in the DC Circuit's decision. And, and just on that point, the WeWork Commission also found that those types of pricing plans were not per se a problem and the notion that this is something, if anything, it should argue from the contrary, which is public safety should, in light of public safety concerns, people should be able to engage in more network management and more affirmatively control their networks than the other way around. So I, I do think it's right here. Okay, in the, other, in, in the first round, the big issue was notice in Verizon. And the court basically said, if you subscribe to Con Daily, TR Daily, that's enough notice. That's all I need to know. Exactly. And, and the, that notice went right up around there. In this, in this proceeding, people made a big deal about all of the, uh, the Clintonism and the fake comments um, that, you know, the, and the agency moved before all voices were heard or something. Uh, and I'm just wondering, do you think that's going to hold any merit for the court at all? Because the people you know, you know like we, we can't rule on this because the FCC ignored all these, you know, I like green jello comments. Uh, and or. Well, what I'm thinking is that the rule you have to read all the significant comments. Right. We'll consider it more of the significant. Um, Define significant. That's well, the problem. Well, I is it, is it one pager? It's a one pager that. Know, 300 million other people s submitted as well. Is that significant? Maybe it is if you can, can only read it once <laughs> and you know say that X number of people agree with this. But um, you know there was other stuff in the docket too. There were there were you know vulgar things in the docket. There were there was mischief going on with the FCC's computer systems, with the phone systems being jammed up. So. I don't know. I don't. I think it's. I think it's somewhat of a, of a departure. I mean, this is. I think an area where the FCC is on extremely solid ground. The, the administrative law requirement is to respond to significant arguments of the record. Anyone who's read the RIF order knows it did so uh, to to an extraordinary degree. Unfortunately, for those of us who work with the FCC, you know, we're now in an era where there are a lot of click to send copycat comments on both sides. And they, they, they affect the politics surrounding this debate, and there's a lot of politics surrounding the investigation of, of, of that. But, but from a legal standpoint, the FCC um, sort of cleared the bar by a wide margin when it comes to dealing with the record. I would just say I uh, would presume the court would be very cognizant of if they set a different standard. This would apply to all federal agencies and all rulemaking, and I don't think that they would want to go down that. It's not a plumb aside, you don't do it this way, it's just, yeah. All right, so last question, as I see Commissioner O'Reilly's here, I won't take too long. Um, but let's, let's, let's sort of wrap up this, like, where does all this leave us, the policy implications of the case? Um, you know, U.S. Telecom, the installment votes that Matt brought up, uh, the problem with U.S. Telecom is that, well, everybody focused on the statutory question, nobody focused on the implementation question. I think that's a huge outstanding. Case, regardless of what the DC Circuit he thinks, that, you know, may or may not go up to the Supreme Court. And then we have the congressional implications of it. Um, so, where does this leave us? Because, you know, we do have a change in Congress. Uh, I've heard rumor that one of the first actions is going to be to sort of bring an omnibus and just work to codify the rules. Uh, that was the idea, I think, the reason. Codify the 15 rules? Yeah. And, <coughs> yeah. So, so, where are we? What do we do? Are we going to come back in five years? At least another year from my daughter in college. Um, so, Brian, let's start with you real quick. Okay, I'm a, contrary to what I, well, I, I, I will be an optimist. I will say that if you look at uh, this debate over the last 15 years, that there is relative bipartisan support for a core set of principles that would apply, that you could memorialize in a statute and quit the ping pong, uh, make it Title I, but have there be explicit, you know, for maybe it's for freedom, for explicit provisions. Um, that would look somewhere between the 2015 rules and, um, and this set, this rule, this set of rules. 
and you can find a common ground. I think there should be. I think it's better for the country if there is one. Uh, I would like to see this be an example of bipartisanship. Uh, to stabilize this, it's an incredibly important part of our economy. You are so good. I mean, you are so, I love it, man. I don't even know if I convince myself in telling that story, but that's what I would like to think. Maury? One of the things that I would hope that would happen in the next five years is that some of these debates would be basically overtaken by events. A lot of these management techniques have to do with being an abandoned of constrained environment. That's why it was particularly strange that uh, wireless got pulled, pulled into this, where the management requirements seem particular with something like Brian, uh, that Brian identified, and a much more uh, widely available, uh, you know, uh, pipe, uh, probably hate that word, but anyway, uh, network, uh, maybe these debates will move on to, to, to something else. Because I, I do have concerns about the idea that having plans that uh, give people free services, you know, zero rate, you know, that, that those are bad things for consumers. I never understood why that was bad for consumers, and I would be very concerned about that continuing. Uh, but perhaps between some core principles and some increases in uh, network um, availability and, and uh, speed, these things will get solved. And we'll move on to some other arguments. What happens when I go home to Thanksgiving and a distant relative say, wait, you're the one who's against net neutrality. And I say, no, no one is against net neutrality. And as Brian said, you know, what gets lost in this debate is just we're fighting over means, two ends. We're fighting over Title II, Title I, general conduct standard or not. But there's a remarkable degree of consensus around core principles that the, the clients I work with all support. Uh, and, and they're all calling affirmative for, legisl for legislation. I mean, that is a, a strong foundation for agreement. You know, politics get in the way, but I, I am also optimistic, like Brian, that this isn't that hard. There are a couple of issues where we need to bridge some divides if we have a legislative debate around interconnection or a general public standard, but it's eminently doable. And the fact that, that all segments of the industry, from edge providers to transit providers to ISPs, all embrace a, a, a pretty strong consensus group of principles, and we hope that we can have legislation that would, would work this out. Uh, look, this is, at the end of the day, this is about anti-competitive behavior. You know, no throttling, no pay prioritization. We have to insert the word anti-competitive in there because that's why we're getting tangled up with these very consumer-friendly product offerings that are having the potential to disrupt a nice ecosystem. The other thing that I keep thinking about, too, is in 2007, um, 700 megahertz auction, open access condition on the C block, which significantly depressed the price for spectrum. That's fine. Verizon acted in the best interests of its country, of its shareholders. But whoever talks about a, that now, nobody. And it was so much blood and so much ink and you know a lot of venom at the time. And it has just been completely superseded by technology and other events. Uh, I want to thank the panel for a, a really great time. Uh, we learned a lot. I want to thank everybody. Uh, let me bring up Commissioner O'Reilly right now while he's here. Um, and we'll present the new all award. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.